Nolan, hello. Hey, it's good to be here, Paul. Good to see you, and thank you for agreeing to do this. This is just this is going to be wonderful. Well, you know, it's an area that is near and dear to my heart. I've been fussing around with robotics and, and self-driving cars for 30 years. <laughs> Too long. <laughs> wow. So how do you usually introduce yourself these days, given all the things that you've been doing? I mean, it's been a long career forging new industries, and I know you've had 30 some different enterprises in which you've been involved. So how, how, where do you even start with that kind of, well, with that kind of experience? I, I like to say I'm a serial entrepreneur with kind of one foot firmly placed in the future. At least I think that way. And uh, I founded Atari and then later on Chuck E. Cheese and then a company called Androbot, which I lost a ton of money, uh, you know, which was one of the early personal robotics companies. And Done. I basically uh, founded ETAC, which uh, if you drive a car and have a map app, it's basically using my software. And so, oh. you know, it, we we mapped the world, and uh, that database has been extensive, and and, uh, and uh, I'm quite proud of that. Right now, I'm uh, on your board. And, uh, and, uh, I'm working and on a company for that. <laughs> and I'm working on a company called Exadexa, which is a gamified educational platform, a thing called Moxie, which is a gaming challenging esports thing and working on a project called Atari labs and, and writing a couple of books. So, uh, I've clearly retired. <laughs> Yeah. Every time we meet and thank you for being on the board of Pro Robotics and we've had some good times there and continue to do so. But I always have questions that I never think to ask you because we're always engaged with conversation around projects and things that are being deployed in business. But I always wanted to ask, what was the first game you ever played? Oh, I... Growing up, summers on a blanket, board games were a big part of my life. And I think the very first game I played was maybe Monopoly or Clue. Um, and uh, that was fun and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and then I fell in love with chess and then I fell in love with Go. Uh, <laughs> and so... Um, and uh, I played a lot of poker and bridge in, in college. And I probably, if I didn't play as much poker and bridge in college, I'd probably got better grades. But uh, <laughs> I've kind of, you know, I've always had sort of one foot in the game field. Growing up just outside Atlantic City, Monopoly was a big deal in the household. Oh, yeah. And my and my dad actually worked for Atlantic City Electric Company. So when you landed on the Electric Company logo, you had to you had to try to buy it out from under him. So it was always a competitive <laughs> competitive piece to buy. Right. But um, you once told me, I think it was, I think you told me this. Did you tell me that gaming is the gateway drug to becoming a high tech geek or just person who wants to be involved with high tech industry? I that, think so. I think we, I think we like, there are people who like to be problem solvers. And, and I think that proclivity leads them to software inevitably and games are, yeah, the gateway drug. I, I really believe that. I mean, I can think of no software programmer that's any good that doesn't play video games. Not a single one. No, I'm sure there's some exist, but I just don't happen to know them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there was a stigma around video games. It seemed like in the, from what I remember in the eighties, and I was a gamer, I had an Atari 2600. I had a Commodore 64, which had its 
share of games. And there was a stigma back then, right? And maybe even in the 90s, right? Like with violence or whatever. But the, the fact of the matter is there's so many games that are really complex puzzles w- with rich storylines. You felt like you were reading a book. I used to play Infocom games, if you remember those. Yeah. And, well, you know, there were actually some countries that banned coin-op video games. And uh, it's interesting to know that they all, any of those countries, they are a laggard in in computer programmers. Well, there you go. There you- the, the, the stats prove it. Existence proof. <laughs> yeah. With my own son today, I mean, he learns problem solving and the problems and the puzzles and the things that that you solve. I mean, you learn how to, in many ways, program. You learn about logic. You learn about three-dimensional space and your your spatial intelligence that you develop just seems to be so enhanced by some of the games that you can actually play. And I, and I think that's pivotal to programming. Well, I think... With my kids, I was always a gamer and always had sort of the latest computer and what have you. And I, I know that I set them on the trajectory of being programmers and techs, techies. <laughs> In fact, my youngest son was so fascinated with video games, my wife and I thought, okay, we're going to have to limit this. And, you know, and, and, you know, we had a big house and so kids could kind of had, had sort of their own areas and couldn't always police it. So I said, there was software that you could shut down. You could limit the n- number of hours they could do on any particular thing. And then, then the, the thing is screen over. Well, my son put on a key logger and found my password and then broke it. <laughs> And I thought to myself, okay, if he can do that, I'm not worried about him. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's classic. Where there's a will, there's a way. Exactly. I mean, one of the things that I don't think a lot of people know or are aware of is that you were involved with a robotics company in the 1980s. Um, but it was obviously bleeding edge, right? Trying to build robotics today is difficult, certainly autonomous vehicles, and we'll talk about that. But but back in the 80s with the limited technology, I mean, that was like Charles Babbage trying to build a computer maybe in some ways. It was the, the technology was not co- quite all the way there. Um, not even close. I mean, we, th- th- even the software, you know, w- multitasking software hadn't been invented yet. And so, you know, there's so many threads that you have to do to have all the sensors and everything. You know, uh, we were trying to invent way too much. I, I, I overstepped that a lot um, and ended up building a big expensive toy. <laughs> but you you had orders for a good number of them, from what I recall. Oh, yeah. We sold a lot of the big expensive toy because there was a programming language called Logo, which was kind of, you could, you know, teach the robot you could do a little program and have it go you know turn 90 degrees east go forward 20 feet turn left what that kind of thing and uh, a lot of schools bought it to teach this fundamental program called logo wow so you actually sold ro- robots yeah y- you sold them you sold these things that that's yeah. actually there are uh, multi-billion dollar eight companies today that haven't sold a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, if you go on on uh, uh, some of the old things, you know, the uh, uh, you can find them online right now. I think an Androbot right now, we were selling for about 900 bucks, 800. And uh, I went on to, uh, to eBay and found one for 4,000 bucks. Oh, wow. So they're, <laughs> they're appreciating. <laughs> yeah. What kind of computers did these things have? What kind of sensors? Had a 386, um, oh. Intel, single threaded software operating on it. 
and um, we had primarily IR short range and ultrasonics. IR is infrared, so yeah, shooting at right. a beam of essentially like light and that reflects Precisely. and tells you the distance to something. Yeah, exactly. Ultrasonics, the same, but with sounds, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, interesting. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, ultrasonics have, are all over all, automobiles today. You're back, a lot of backup sensors on cars or ultrasonic. Yeah. And uh, they were infrared, cheap. you know, were they, were they big and bulk, big and bulky back then? Or no, they were about the size of a thimble. Okay. So not unlike what we got today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the early Roombas had infrared sensors and what have you right. on them. And they probably, they still might, I, I don't even know, but. What are your thoughts on the trajectory of robotics from then to today? Is it something that's, um, in your opinion, a long ways out from becoming really prolific? Like, how would you differentiate robotics back then to what you see today and, and where do you see it going? Well, today you can, when, I mean, what we're really talking about is autonomy and the technology now actually allows aut autonomy much better. I mean, the Roomba is a prime example of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think they, there's some uh, lawnmowers that are pretty autonomous right now. Um, there's a lot of autonomy going on in warehouses and pallet movings and things like that. So it's at the dawn of being useful, I, I like to say. And that, uh, and and I'm one of these big believers that the the more you can eliminate jobs, the better off we are. Um, I'm a great his, you know, fan of history, and and the Luddites and you know the weaving industry in England tried to shut down automation, and uh, you know automation basically cut the cost of fabric by a fact by an order of magnitude a factor of 10 and uh india that outlawed automatic looms kept their population in poverty because the weavers had to compete with the looms so they couldn't make any money so you know it, and it, it's it's every time you try to stop progress it hurts somebody and, and, uh, and it's, yeah, and it's inevitable, it seems that it's just going to occur anyway. There's nothing that's going to, you, can't stop you it. might slow it down a little bit, but. Yeah. It, well, that's like with AI, but, you know, I hear people saying, oh, we got to be really worried about self-driving cars. Think of all the taxi drivers and all the truck drivers that are going to be put out of a job. And I say, hooray, you know. <laughs> There's so many other things that these people need to do, you know, uh, and uh, like the world I envision is takes everybody a long time to build. And so the more we can free up the labor, I've always said there's there's basically no no unemployment unless you have a society that lacks imagination or the government is stupid and we have a little bit of both of that but <laughs> <laughs> well you know techno technology advances tend to and especially with automation tend to take over those mundane things that people don't want to do and don't necessarily do well because it requires a lot of attention right and human or, beings, or dangerous things or dangerous right yeah you know, put you in a yeah a dangerous situation um, but in human beings, you know, we're creative um, beasts. We make tools and we like to kind of create things like art. And, you know, and computers weren't, at least until maybe it's seemingly recently, weren't really doing that. But now I just saw like a video of an artificially intelligent John Lennon singing a song that he didn't sing, but it was like a new song and <laughs> it was all created by artificial intelligence. So like, are we going to climb above that? Like what, what's the meta level above creativity? <laughs> 
I hope you enjoyed the show Driven with me, Paul Perone, your host. Don't forget to check us out at driven.show on the web. And give us a thumbs up or subscribe here if you like the show. Thank you for listening in. See you soon.